All right, if I can make this thing work, technology, you all think I'm technologically on the forefront, but my son will tell you that when we, uh, <clears throat> with all the stuff that goes on on the farm today, that today I've been relegated to, Dad, I need you to come run the combine today. I said, okay. When you get in the cab, do not touch anything. I said, if I don't touch anything, we can't move the combine. He says, I know. So, with that said, through a farmer's eyes, why is that important? When I, when, I, when I first took on the task of understanding why um, water was important uh, was early in the 2000s and MPPD came to us and, and said that, uh, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna drill this well field before the uh, moratorium comes in place. And it's gonna be one of the largest commercial well fields in the state of Nebraska. And I asked the question, well, why, why is that? Why, why do we need this? Um, why do we need this well field? And the answer that I got the first day was that we want to make sure that, that all the air conditioners and the municipal water supplies run in the eastern end of the state. And I said, gosh, you know, uh, for, for us, they're talking about our livelihood is that um, they were going to ask us uh, to uh, possibly reduce our irrigation so that those wells could run. So Bill Furman was the CEO at the time, and he was very, he had, a, he had a lot of vision. And he came to us and he said, you know, I'd like to bring you landowners together, and I want to talk about a relationship, about how we can, how we can exist together, but more importantly is how do we understand to look at this, this uh, aquifer collectively, and, and what does that mean to our society, to the state of Nebraska, and more importantly, to your community and to your farm. We spent the next nearly year and a half working with engineers. Frank Kronoski is here in the, in the room with us, and, and Frank was on that team, and others, Brian Burrells, I can reel them off. I know every name because I didn't know anything about that piece of the puzzle. But one of the things that kept popping up was the Coheist model, cooperative hydrology study. And I go, what is that? What, what is going on there? It was a significant investment in understanding the connections of groundwater and their impacts to stream flows. And I said, well, how come we don't talk about the other side of that conversation about what impacts that, that uh, uh, downstream users or diversions or, or, or I didn't know the right questions to ask. I didn't know how to interface with those conversations and really know what was going on. So <clears throat> I didn't really decide to educate myself as much as I just wanted to know who they were and understand where they were coming from. And, and be able, to, be able to see it through their eyes and hopefully meet them where they were with what I knew. And conversely, put that same perspective in, on, on me and place that responsibility on me uh, to be able to do that. And so, um, let me try that. So you're gonna see this again. So quickly take a look at it. I, I hope you can see it okay. I would assume you can. But because they were asking me as a producer, I have a lot of hats to wear, didn't understand the language, and as a stakeholder, and it, the further I got into the conversations with, as a board member with the NRD, is I, I didn't know what that was. And so I had to look back and what happened in the 40s. My grandparents um, uh, came to that area and started a farm and, and looking at, you know, why would I even be interested in water? What are some of the next steps and, and uh, what brought them here? Well, it was because it, was, it, it had this bountiful amount of water and good soil. Then in the 50s, of course, I, I'm, I'm showing you how old I am, but more importantly, I want you to look to the right and look at that technology. That's technology circa 1960, you know, two channels and rabbit ears, and, and uh, opportunity exists that the telephone that we had had a crank in the middle of it on a um, open party line, and my, I still remember a phone number, 1F3, two, two longs and a short. Then we came into the 60s, and that truck on the left is a 1948 K Model International, and we were chopping silage uh, is because we were, we were doing everything. We were feeding cattle, we were milking cows, we were doing everything. And so we jumped fast forward, 
And we'll let this video load, hopefully. I don't have it on my screen to hit play. Can I do it there? I can't see it, Tom. It's not muted because we can hear it a little bit. There you go. So we jump fast forward through all of those things. And how much time? Okay. Oh, but now it's got a webcam on. <laughs> you are muted. Mute this? Okay. All right. So this planner today gathers data in real time across 90 foot at 6 miles an hour, 70 acres an hour. It's measuring soil moisture and in furrow integrity and its singulation. And, and it is an amazing amount of data that is created. And, it, and it's all sitting in our cab and sending this to the cloud. And we're able to precisely look at all the opportunities that exist to create that environment for that plant to be as successful as it ever can be. So we need to stop that now. <laughs> Somehow, I don't know how this is jumping back and forth. <clears throat> so we're going to go into the 70s corn harvest. And you can look. There's no yield monitors. There's no the grain carts. There's a single axle truck. And, and my grandfather uh, going forward at uh, I mean, it, it, this was quite a deal. We were six rows, and we were lucky to do 30 acres a day. To today, what happens is this. That was just taken about a month ago, or during harvest. Uh, my son was actually in that video, but it, 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 it displays the differences in what that looked like not so long ago, three decades ago to where we are today. This is a picture of our farm. Uh, uh, we were nominated and uh, uh, got a conservation award for the Twin Plat NRD for trees and conservation and not so long ago. But what I wanted to show you is more about the pivots and what happens. And this is where I came from. Is this is this is row crop? Anybody familiar with siphon tubes and and bead ditches? Is is this is what I started out? I was a Lincoln County tube setting champion two years in a row uh, back in high school. So you know very familiar with what it took. Uh, but th this isn't practiced a lot. But it, it and it's not forgotten. But when I show my kids or work with other people involved in the evolution of water and and what it's meant to your community and to your own. Uh, um, business or your own uh, state or, or government, it, it, it is clear that you have to be able to be a part of it. You have to be a part of that conversation. So how did you do that? Why, why would I ever go to there? So it, I decided to do on my own to start a program called Producer Driven Outcomes and <clears throat> took the whole farm and I engaged with industry, the John Deere's, the Aqua Spies, the, and I'll leave out a whole bunch of them, but there was a lot. And take that process and start to vet it is how can we make this better? How can we, because of all those conversations, because of how we grew, you know, how do we do this differently? And it was using technology. It was a, it was a, it was a growth project that was going to get away from us. So it went from increasing yields to really looking at and how we're going to look at every acre in that field and how we're going to change it. So I don't particularly like maximizing production, but that... That is, is easily the best way to put it. So this is a step-by-step -step process of how we started. And these were all readily available public um, uh, backgrounds that could help us make better decisions in mapping and EC mapping. And it helped us define water holding capacity and really set a delineation of what our fields look like. Taking that soil survey, taking the EC map, and, and it's still very similar. But what it did is it, it, it started to move us towards understanding precision. You know, how, how much can we afford to get to be pre precise? Then elevation became a player. We were measuring elevation with our GPS on all of our machines. Why was that important? Because slopes and elevation have an influence on what we're doing outside. So we started to create these, these zones, these management zones as a result of that. And we didn't have a lot of help. It was early in on the industry. So we started asking a lot of questions of providers. So creating seeding maps out of this and seeding rates 
and, and putting us in a position to understand better. What do hybrids do under drought conditions or, or reduced seeding rates or, or limited irrigation or all of those, those buzzwords that everybody was tossing around? Creating irrigation plans, it was unheard of. We were some of the first to do speed control, which is on your left, which is just speeding up and slowing down the machine, and to prescription uh, irrigation down to, to a segment, a small segment in each field. So how do you do that? Why would you do that? And using those base maps and base information to build fertilizer, seeding rate, and a watering rate. And those pieces really added more complexity. They started getting more and more uh, decisions and processes that we had to go through. Then it was saving water. How could you figure out? We're in an allocated basin. About a third of our farm is in the Republican. So we had to figure out how to operate under a highly consumptive situation and, and manage that and understanding what those are. The next thing was subsurface drip. You can fix everything that you're going to do, but there was no way. It's too expensive for us. We didn't have high enough value crops to be able to do that. But does it make sense in the future? Absolutely. Saving water. Are we really saving water or are we just retiming it and, and reprioritizing the use inside that same field? Same way with reducing water pumped. I'd argue that all it's done is raise the awareness about how you apply that water and trying to get the most value out of, out of understanding of what that water is. And so I always, I always are on the internet looking around, but Hoffmer uh, put this up there and I'm not going to read it, but you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I never stopped learning. I've never stopped taking the time. So that systems approach to irrigation management was a great one. You know, everybody's got creating a sustainable world. What does that mean? And, and I'm not particularly fond of the word sustainable. Does that mean just we're just going to stop doing what we're doing because we've achieved that? No. Nor will we stop on our own operation. It's a cornerstone of the decisions that happen in our operation. So you can see this pivot and our farm is there. But on the left is what they call a, <clears throat> is a planned rate. And then on the right is actually what, what happens. So we set up as a prescription. And then after you go through the field, uh, it actually shows in real time exactly what we're doing. So the seeding rate is a good example of what I want to talk about in water quality. Is nitrogen management today is, is to a whole new level. And you're going to hear more and more and more about it. Why? Because of water quality issues in our drinking supply. The sins of the past, of, of, a, of some time ago, about settling along rivers and feedlots and hog farms and, and municipalities that, that had, didn't have treatment plants. But you know what? That's OK. We've got, a, we've got a, a system in place. We've got bright young minds. We've got a process to start to drive home some, some really positive things. So in our own operation, we, we had to start making some decisions because there was a lot out there. How much water? How much, what, what is the crop stage? How much water does it need at a, at a time in its life? How much is it even using when it is there? And how much water is received or applied? And more importantly is, what does precipitation even have in, it, in, it, in its effect? 10 years ago, this was very slow. And what I showed you earlier was, was really uh, took some time. Now two years, in the last two or three years, change is just moving. And now it's 18 months, and I'll challenge you that within, within another year or so, every six months, you're going to see another challenge. So how did we start to try to understand that? Soil moisture probes. They brought them to us, calibration, didn't know by crop. But what it started to tell us was is actually what was going on underneath, underneath the soil. But clearly, I still didn't understand. <clears throat> so I went to uh, Chandler, Missouri, the, the water utilization facility that Monsanto had, and they they put this crop stage in front of us. And you see the blue line above right underneath the plant. That's, that's, that's full field capacity. The green is actually where you want to operate. And then the red is wilting point. When we first started gathering the data on our own farm, we operated in the blue. I'm not embarrassed about that. That was the best technology we had. But now with the tools that we have, ET gauges, in-field weather stations, the, the potential of the data that, that is put in our hands but now we need the help. We need understanding what the, all those correlations are. Another one that we started capturing in real time and understanding, and my engineering friends out here, reference ET, I, I didn't know what that was. I didn't understand the, the relationship of the different plants and, and the, um, the residue management that we had and all those things and what that captured within that plant. 
But what I started getting was a real clear understanding of, of what was happening at a regional level. So then it wasn't good enough. So what are we going to do? We went field level. Nobody provided that. And it's still sketchy today. But with the remote irrigation systems, the, the tools that we have, we start to see that in real time. Below, you'll see the rain events or precip or irrigation events. You see what it does and how it responds within the soil. Then we tied nitrogen management to that, trying to understand if, if we place nitrogen through the water into that soil, would, would, it be, would it be more efficient? And then how much water was applied? Meters were, were one way to do that, but it still wasn't at the field level. It still wasn't in real time. It was a number at the begin and a number at the end, end that said, you know what, you pump 6.2 inches. So it was promote, promoted as best management practices all along. And Einstein said, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. BMPs are awesome. But why do we just, what, what, why are they the only thing that we want to use? Why wouldn't we want to improve those? And how do we do that? And how do you engage producers to help with that? How do you go tell IBM that you want better weather? How many apps do you have on your phone that tell you weather? I want better weather. I want, I want resolution of weather. I want 30 meters square resolution of weather. That's difficult. Refined forecasts. This is 11 days forecast that I asked for. I challenged the companies because uh, with dicamba and a lot of the other crop protection things that we're using fungicides, it relies on a really good weather model that puts us in a place that we have to understand what temperature inversions would do to that. So I'm going to go back to that first slide that I showed you, and I'm going to show you a day in the life of a farmer. So I've touched on every one of these, weather stations, field sensors, equipment tools, the good old hand probe, still do that today, and more importantly, the water meter. It changed behavior. It changed thought processes. It changed engagement. So these tools are out there. So what did that mean? So all at once, everybody had a good idea about weather, soil, and imagery. They're going to help you. For a few dollars an acre, they're going to send you a model that's going to make you a better producer. Crop, pest, and water. We're going to send you a model. We're going to make you a better producer. And we're going to do that. We're going to take an image and send it to you. So then we're going to send all of these field data alerts and precision ag applications and create this complexity model that just continues, continues, continues and layer after layer after layer and better idea after better idea. What does that mean? How are we going to make better management decisions? And who's going to make them? Ultimately, who does it? Who does that ball fall down to? It's that guy right in the middle, the grower. He's trying to balance that with community, family, church, school, everything that else is going on around it. So then the consultant world comes around. And we can help you. We can help define some of those data points that are all coming to you. Well, that's OK. That's great. Well, where are you getting your information? Well, then the regulatory framework came, and they said, OK, allocations. And you've saved water in the Republican, but all at once, your saved water now has a hard cap because of compact compliance. Well, what does that mean? And to most producers, they relied on that whole system of trust with a board that they elected to make those decisions, to make that understanding. I said, no, I'm going to understand this. Then you have sales, inventory, back office, all of those things. Well, let's not forget marketing. Geez, if you don't sell what you're doing and you're not profitable or you don't have an ROI, and all this stuff that's up above there is not free. Free in time, free in commitment, free out of your checkbook. So how do you, how do you, how do you juggle that opportunity? Then all at once they want traceability. What are you doing with your chemicals, crop protection, and your fertility, and your phosphorus, and your nitrogen, and your boron, everything else? Then the processor, he gets involved, and he wants to have a specific product. He wants a specific plant with a specific output because he's got a buyer asking for it. But really, who really wants it? The consumer. And do they even know? They are. They will. And they're going to drive it. In a minute, you'll see the arrow where it goes back to you know who they want to talk to. They want to, they want to insert themselves into my life, that consumer does. They want to be click their phone, and they want to be able to engage with the guy that grew that, that bag of popcorn that they popped last night. I'm not going to read this, but the one piece at the bottom that says, at the, at the very bottom of that sentence, we generate one terabyte of data every month. That's my son, Zach, standing beside me. And that data is what 
is going to change and revolutionize how we're going to do that. Today there exists too many silos and a ton of them that we don't have a concerted effort to make these decisions and turn it into it. So that's why NUBA got started, is we created this place of you know, a grassroots effort that we could host and, and aggregate these kind of ideas. The cosmic ray probe Dr. Franz first brought me, he had his Husker hat on, and I go, what is this thing? And he brought it out and put it in the center of my field, and he says, it will measure the exchange of water at the soil surface in a 1,300-foot radius. I go, what? No way. What does that mean? Well, it's very expensive, but we calibrated it back against our probes, and we've done it long enough now that you get a, a real familiarity with it. That was a result of this relationship, of this concept and ideas of, of being stakeholders in your outcome. So hydrologically connected. What does all of this mean at the end of the day and everything that I've been involved with? I'm on a USDA a lot in Washington. But the Ogallala Aquifer supports 30% of US crop and livestock production that generates $35 billion in, in agricultural products annually. But I work in Kansas as well, too. And one of the things that Jim Butler said is heavy use of the Ogallala aquifer, aquifer has led to significant depletions. If we do nothing, we know where we're going to end up. Pretty doom and gloom. But I'll tell you that with what we're doing and the strategies and the technology, the investment that, that your own university puts in place is a big part of that. We farm in the Republican and the Twin Platte. And, and when I looked at this strategy to the left, state and water district policies and, and restrict, pump in restrictions, and I didn't understand what all of these things were, but I was just in California a few days ago on a, on a farm tour in the Central Valley outside of Fresno, and these signs were everywhere. California is running on empty build, da build dams now. I mean everywhere. I crossed the, the California aqueduct. I'd never been there before. It's cool. You can see it from the space station, I guess. But I, I, I go, and is there a way? What? I mean, I, I mean why, would, why would you want to build a dam? But more importantly is, why wouldn't we? I mean, in, in any kind of conversation, a solution, a process, why is it off the table? Why are we so out, out of tune with disruption? Disruption is what creates creativity. So I just saw this. Wisconsin just passes a phosphorus water quality clearinghouse. I'm going, hey, whoa. We're going to trade phosphorus for whose benefit? Then I see this running out of water, running out of time. There's places that believe that and, and truly are in a challenged area. And so that guy there with the irrigation well usually is the poster child of that conversation. Is they're the, they're the biggest contributor to these problems and challenges is that irrigation well that runs back there. But that's the source of my balance sheet, my community, the economics that drive our own place. And in the background, we're creating a sustainable world. That's why I didn't put it on the front. I, I question uh, whether that's really a goal of mine. It, more about is how do we create, how do we create the, the kind of consensus that it takes to develop and move. I was recently in New York City, uh, launched a, an, an interesting weather piece with a company. And, and uh, this was uh, Union Square in downtown. And it's this huge farmer's market. And these people are walking through there buying this, and this guy had popcorn, yellow popcorn, I was going to put it up there, getting $18 a pound. I get 17 cents a pound as a producer. But they're a high level of confidence when they're walking through there about the source of their food. So this is actually a life in the day of the farmer right here. I want you to know that that front truck is snow removal in front of the combine, and then in the back is fall harvest. And, and that really epitomizes what, we, what our challenges are. But I want to leave you with this, is clearly there's no one solution. There's always plenty of room on the team for ideas and for concepts about what we can do collectively together to not only look at conservation but stewardship as a cornerstone of our operation. I have thoroughly enjoyed. I, I am humbled. And clearly, we're on a path that will allow that collaboration. And it's, it's a tribute to you as well in this room that, that we, have, we are gaining ground and that opportunity just stares us in the face. Thank you.
And I will take questions, I think, <laughs> if anybody has any. Mark, what do you and your producer buddies make of this recent shift from animal-based protein to plant-based protein? Don, I knew I could leave it to you. I, I, and, and here's what I tell my, my livestock friends is I grow vegetable protein. Uh, I grow yellow peas, and I actually have a contract with one of the growers that actually provides a significant amount of the vegetable protein as an isolate into Beyond Meat. And um, it's not going away. Uh, I was really, uh, the other day I walked into Dunkin' Donut, I had my five-year-old grandson, and, and he actually wanted to go across the street because I would got him something at, at some place a couple of weeks before, and he goes, Grandpa says, I want to go over there. I said, now let's go to Dunkin' Donut. It's faster. And I walk in, and, and they just, big placard that they now had uh, beyond sausage inside of their, their sandwich. So the pork guys now uh, have that. You know, um, here's, here's what I, here's how I take that, is uh, we have always been on the backside of, of, um, of as takers of a market. And our response has always been, in our own operation, and that's what I'll speak to, is that that um, uh, we want to do that has a good return on investment, that it meets our goals of conservation and stewardship. And not so long ago, I didn't say that, Don, uh, that those weren't priorities in our, inside of our own operation. But I will say this, that right now, peas don't take a lot of water. They fit in a really good dry land system. And with the technologies that have emerged within the genetics of soybean and of corn, that we're able to start to really evaluate and optimize dry land farming. And, you know, it is the supplemental water that we have to provide in our area of the Ogallala Aquifer. Is it uh, economically sustainable for us with the energy cost and the taxation and all the other pieces of the puzzle that, that we can continue to even do that? So it becomes an opportunity. Um, and so far, I would say that, that uh, and even put it even more in context, within 100 miles of our main operation, there's over a million head of cattle on feed. A million head. So what does that take? That takes protein. That takes corn. That takes some type of, of, of uh, interaction with ethanol and dry distillers or wet distillers grains. So, you know, that piece is not going away. That's a whole infrastructure that is different. But you travel enough to know that when, when you go to either coast, that the Midwest is in, insulated in some of those conversations. And I, I kind of look forward to seeing more and more because we're all going, OK, what do we do next? But in, in, my, own, in my own way, and, and, and I believe I can speak, I'll speak just for myself, is that um, uh, as the, the, the food evolves, uh, the food chain evolves, that that piece that I showed you the complexity and the answers and the expectations from the consumer, that I'm going to have to ring that bell about what, what my use is and what my interface is with, with the utilization of those inputs, i.e. water and crop protection and, and fertilizer. Long-winded answer. I apologize. Uh, thanks, Rourke, over here. Uh, first of all, thank you for your support uh, over the years. I appreciate you uh, allowing me to work on your farm. I've really uh, learned a lot and continue to uh, work on there. Appreciate that. I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, irrigation and uh, the uh, adoption rate of some of the advanced irrigation technology. Variable rate, variable speed is still pretty low. So I guess I um, wanted to ask you about what are some of those barriers to adoption and would you put on variable rate or variable speed across all of your farm? And uh, I guess do you understand that variability within the field to take advantage of that technology yet? Oh my gosh, okay. Um, great, great question. And, and Trenton, uh, thank you for taking the time to, to invest in us to, to vet you know, ideas and concepts uh, with your technologies. When I first, when I first kind of bailed into the middle of this um, technology piece, I thought it was a no-brainer. Uh, we operate a pretty significant operation in southwest Nebraska, and one of the, our challenges is, is finding people. 
finding people that, that have the same kind of values and, and work ethic that, that I think that they needed. And I, I want you to hear that, that I think that they needed. And the adjustment was that we had to start thinking about what they needed and clearly uh, how to uh, get them engaged with, with being invested in it. So the technology was a no-brainer to us, is, is in that palm of our hand to understand you know, what, what's happening with that tractor, that we could actually log into the screen and see where they were in the field and, and the screen that is actually in there uh, showed as applied rates and the script was loaded properly, that they're even in the right field, that they hadn't fallen asleep with the GPS on and crossed a, a guidance boundary and ended up in the next field disking up uh, corn that was already knee high. It has happened. So when we first got involved with NUBA and a lot of these conversations across even research and, and extension, that it was apparent to me that it wasn't occurring. And it was a frustration of mine that when the accounting system in the Republican Basin came up, that uh, the big number is always is there, there's two numbers in the Republican and one of them was pumping, and it's average pumping. So if, you're, if your allocation was 12 inches and you came in at 8.9, well, that means that somebody was higher than that and somebody had to be significantly lower to be at 8.9 because not everybody's going not, not to apply water at the same rate. And so we, we happened to be in that lower range, not necessarily the lowest, but in the lower range. And it frustrated me that all at once I was, I was investing significant dollars into our operation so that somebody else could, could not even look at adoption. And so I had to rethink about how that, that, that piece actually happened and how do you change behavior? How do you do that? And we went through several pieces. We thought, you know, worked with extension. We worked with, with industry. We worked with John Deere. We worked, I mean, I can reel them off, over 100 of them. And they all had the same thing. And a lot of the startups were in the same way. They were coming with these great ideas about imagery and soil moisture and all that stuff, but they'd run up against this 15, 20% adoption. They'd gotten $40 million incentives to, to create this, this next widget, and it'd die on the vine because they couldn't get to that next layer where the bills would get paid. So again, kind of revisited that. And it wasn't long ago, and some of you may or may not have heard of the TAPS project. Dr. Rudnick called me. All right, Dr. Rudnick, uh, you know, put that idea in play, and it was a Sunday evening, and I don't call people on Sunday. That's a day that uh, Deb and I, uh, we try to, it's, it's yard day, she calls it, and I reluctantly fill the bird feeders and make sure that everything else is done that Deb thinks needs to be done, even if there's a pivot broke down, and, uh, but I do get to do that later on in that day. So when, when, when that characterization was put in front of me, I, I thought, gosh, um, how, do, how do we move the needle? And I called Darren and I said, what a great idea is create this, this platform to, that, that no investment other than time. There was a prize at the end of the, of the tunnel. But more importantly is let's require them to become part of a peer network. Who better to learn from than your own peers? And, and take the burden off of a researcher extension or or industry and take it upon ourselves as producers to tell that story. It started out very small. There were, I mean, there was, there was not that many of us in the first class, and, uh, but the enthusiasm and the attendance, and, and it has now grown to a, a significant grant across three states. I was in conversation with Jason Warren at Oklahoma State this morning, who uh, is part of that grant that Dr. Rednick also got collectively and doing the same thing. So the progression to me is where it has to go. It, it, it is we have to take responsibility as producers to be able to say that. And if I don't do that, how's it ever gonna go anywhere? And my son knows that as well too. And is it, is it fast enough, Trenton? No, it is not. I, I think that it, it needs to do something better. But I'll also tell you this whole data piece, the whole investment uh, you're seeing from the outside, really because of all the data that we have and all these silos that we have, that there is now a, a, a significant interest uh, from, from some, some pretty deep pockets 
that want to figure out how to take that data and start to make better, better and better and better decisions and really influence behavior. So we're still challenged. Uh, that's not going away. I'd love to paint a rosier picture. I'd love to be able to tell you that that beef, you know, is 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 going to be in, on on um, is still going to be up here, and maybe it is in my home. But I think there's going to be other homes that 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 vegetable protein is going to be up here, and, and beef is not going to be a part of that. I get that. I also know that that organic growers may have a placeholder over me because I I, I choose to be a conventional. Um, practitioner of, of agriculture. So uh, long term, uh, I'll speak to a project that, that Kent has in his own district that, that, is, that is outside of the realm of thinking, but it, it, it's also, again, a, a, an assimilation of a lot of ideas in this room about a what if. What if we're able to capture withdrawals and, and understand irrigation and the behaviors that producers exhibit in a rain event or a different crop. And Kent and his, and his board uh, have taken a leadership role to do that. That's extraordinary. Now, it's 330,000 acres. Does anybody know how many irrigated acres are in Nebraska? Anybody know? Oh, my gosh. Where's Mike Jess when I need him? <laughs> About 9 million, 330,000, do the math. Pretty small percentage, but what an opportunity because it's scalable. It has opportunity. And, and I'm one of those impatient people. I'm also one of those guys that has a whole building full of technologies that I've set aside. But that to me speaks volumes about the opportunity that exists. I think the education and the the, the investment that, that our own university system is putting into water is significant. The Doherty Water for Food piece, significant. The Water Center, significant. We're, I mean, we are keeping and, and engaging at a, at a very high level, but still keeping our eye on the prize, what is, what is a difference maker within this state. That's what gets me up every morning in terms of how do we change that level of adoption. But I also showed you that very complex day in the life of a farmer is each and every one of you with your ideas, you're asking for what, what is most valuable to that producer is time. What is most value to them is an ROI. And so when you make that ask of them, that, that, that's a, that is a significant challenge on, on their part is that it's easy for them to hold you at arm's length. But if it's compelling enough and we're, and we're starting to collectively speak the same language, it, it will make a difference. I believe that. And, and I'm going to continue to be able to do that, uh, uh, as long as I can anyway. And I rely still on all of you for better information and for better ideas and, and bring them to the table. That was a really long answer. <laughs> I feel like I'm lecturing. But I, I usually have to walk around, so I apologize. Anybody else? So I have a question here, Rorick, and thank you for your, your uh, touching on what you just answered. And I'm going to build on that a little with this question, maybe. So as you started early on, as you started adopting this technology and this investment that you made that's not free in both water management and nutrient management, speak to maybe what drove that. How much of that was, you know, ecological conscience, if you will, how much of that was I'm saving money by doing this and how much of it was sort of regulation, threat of regulation, some of that kind of thing. Can I ask your name? Yeah, Rich Nelson. Okay, Rich, thank you for that. Um, whoa, uh, I'm going to keep this down. Um, <laughs> so we've operated in the Republican Basin for nearly as long as it's been under allocation. And it came, became very apparent, and especially when we got into the drought years, that it was not possible to grow a highly consumptive crop. I did not know what consumption was until my, my uh, engineer friends you know, explained to me what consumptive use was. And so we very quickly ran out of water uh, in that basin. And you're sitting with a fourth and fifth year with something less 
than the full water supply that it would take to grow a crop that we could even begin to think that was profitable. And yet the lease terms that we had didn't allow for that. Essentially, if you were out of water, you were out of water. So you could summer follow it and dry land it, but you're still paying irrigated rates. Another thing was is that the, the nutrient side of it is, you know, we're, we're kind of branded as this wild, wild west bunch that uh, we just we just go out and do it and we're just optimizing and we want to grow 300 bushel corn. We did that uh, not so long ago in a, in a project with a, a lot of, of uh, partners. And we, in fact, we grew 307 bushel under pivot. We lost $151 an acre uh, doing that because we accounted for every process that we put into that and what it take uh, to grow that crop. And, and so we recently shifted as a result of some of the better accounting, uh, trying to get to real time is when you're leveraging and borrowing money and, and you're a young producer that doesn't have the capital uh, you have to really understand cash flow. You have to really understand your balance sheet. And it was something that Deb took time out of her teaching career to step away and go part-time while we were still raising. We have four children that uh, she set us up on a set of books that, that I carried everything in my head. And she said, you have got to do a better job. You've got to start figuring that out. And so what I would, what I would say to you is, is as we developed um, those conversations, the software didn't exist the the um, the the level of engagement that they could provide as a product didn't exist or didn't fit an irrigated model it was more after the eastern part where it's just corn and soybeans in a in a rain fed situation so irrigation was okay we can kind of make this work so we kept insisting kept trying to work that model out to where today uh, we create um, uh, tasks or a work order that defines that process and it has assigned right down to depreciation and return on the piece of equipment, the, the labor, the fuel, everything. And then as that goes in is that prescription that you saw, it is as a prescription, but then as the applied comes out, it goes back into the software and it actually accounts for that and gives us a cost of production. Very quickly, I could not compete with a corn grower in Eastern Nebraska or Iowa or a soybean grower because of my costs were too high. I had to figure in depreciation for that pivot and the energy costs that it takes to run it and the labor that it goes out. Well, we were ignoring all of that. And we could when corn was $5, $6, $7, or the input costs were so inexpensive uh, when nitrogen was back under $60, $70 a ton per unit that you know, we could manage uh, in, in a, what I would call a, a less effective way. So as that all of those things came together, it was like a perfect storm, is you had to start to figure it out. And so when you do that, uh, you can take several ways. I mean, you can still do it with a ledger book. You can still rely on a lot of outside influencers that are helping you make those decisions. And we chose to, to really start to drill into that and look at it. That opened the doors to working on and, and actually uh, being a part of, of um, of uh, really seeing what those what those things can do for you so in the end it was about an ROI and since our son I think this is his sixth crop this will be my 35th crop and this is his sixth crop and now he has a family and a young daughter and uh, he has to know he's borrowing money a significant seven figures of money to farm today seven figures and the responsibility that goes with that is, is enormous. And yet, you know, he, he'll stick around and spray another field, you know, jeopardizing his home life. But knowing that if he doesn't get that done, it doesn't meet that, that task-driven oriented software that we have. It kind of, it, it doesn't necessarily enslave you, but it, it gives you a whole different perspective on, on what those numbers look like and what that whole management piece looks like. We know exactly what it costs per acre inch pumped. I'll, I will challenge you, if next time you talk to a, an irrigated producer, ask them what they know, how much it costs them to pump an, a, an acre inch. We know it by well. And, and most may have an average, but I'll challenge you that they don't know. Don't know how much information you put in front of them, but they do not know. Not a slam. It's just that that's not important in that, in that slide that I put together for you. It's not important in their day. 
because they're collectively trying to do what they do really, really well and what they want to focus on and what they think their expertise in. And the rest of it, they rely on different ways of understanding what that is. Uh, my name is David Iaquinta. Uh, I appreciate so many dimensions of the things you're talking about, and I hope you uh, take this uh, question as, as, as positive. Um, all of the efforts that you're working on, technological, financial management, uh, stewardship, all exist within a fundamental bottom line that your production costs in commodity agriculture today uh, are not met very frequently by the receipts that actually come in. So is there a future in your thinking? Is there a future in the direction you're going where we live without subsidies as the basis for how to make commodity agriculture viable? <laughs> First, I'm going to tell you about a subsidy story, if, if, if you'll allow me to here. I ran for office uh, in the 42nd District not so long ago. And we got down to the end, and, and one, of, one of the things that they quickly went to was the EWG website. If you haven't been there, go ahead. But you'll see that I'm one of the top, top, top receivers of, of subsidies. And what you have to look at is, is what period of time that was that all that occurred from 1985 until, until current day. But what the story doesn't tell you is that I grew dry edible beans. I grew potatoes. I grew non-subsidized crops on over a third of our farm. And, and I was able to do OK with that. I was able to figure out how to farm in the absence of subsidies. And yet, if you wanted to participate in the programs and have access to uh, loan, uh, 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 crop loans, I mean, you, there, there was criteria that really didn't fit the model of just saying no, just say no, like they did with the, with the uh, drug program. And so I likened it a little bit to that, but I also have to tell you that as a starting out producer, I would not have survived uh, without that during that period of time. Now, did I lean into it? You could argue yes and no. But I made it a mission to make sure that I had to get to a point, our operation had to be to a point where, where we do not want to be there. But I also know that I have, I have to be able to get USDA good information because it's fundamental to the reports that come out, how, this, the, how the CME trades, how globally we interface in the markets. Is it without good information to them? And so that's a tagline with USDA, with FSA, is, hey, we still need you to come in and certify. We still need you to come in here and talk about the crops that you have and the yields that you have. And oh, by the way, if you want crop insurance, we kind of need you to come in. And it's not a requirement. It's not a, it's not, you don't sign that says that, that that's what you have to do. But it is very, it is very closely knit in how production agriculture operates. So what we've done, in direct answer to what you've done recently, within the last three years, we've been a part of a software program that is, that is uh, I believe, is going to revolutionize a lot of things. And there's been a, a, a significant company that has invested in it. And I've been a part of it since day one that really puts in play real-time balance sheet, that, that the profit analyzer part of that accounts for every activity on the farm. doesn't matter what it is. Depreciation, interest, um, expenses, personal, otherwise. And it collectively builds a process that shows you production. What it allows you to do is go backwards. Is One of the things I'm teaching my son is that's an ROI model. Is we, we set, we look at our APH, our actual production history, because that's a very humbling thing. It's fun to sit in the, in the coffee shop, which I don't get to do often anymore, but I, I lovingly uh, kiss my wife on the cheek at 5.30 in the morning, and she goes, where are you going now? And I just say, I got to go in and listen to the bullshit. And uh, that model has allowed us to ratchet down and be more of, a, of an understanding of what it takes to not only run our operation, but have 
be able to make our principal and interest, but also be able to pay for and look at technology and look at some growth. It surprises people. We have a big whiteboard in our office. They walk up there and they see 207 bushel to the acre. And they go, what is that? Because right next to it is ROI. And they go, what is that? And Zach, Zach's the first one. He jumps right up in the middle of it. By the way, he's six foot seven, six foot six, six foot seven, and just this great kid. You saw him standing next to you there, and he says, that's ROI. You go, ROI? Yeah, that's all we need to make our farm fly. Really? How do you get that? Well, we lean into Corteva and Monsanto Bear and and we have them in our office and we we know our fields intimately enough now that understanding the fertility and, and the as applieds and, and this variable rate technology and we're we're vetting it every day. And we have that 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 planter that's giving us all this baseline data that we're just gonna continue to build on and understand down to a, a, a sub inch level of what that soil is and how it interfaces with that with that applied or timing or 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 genetics and we're reducing populations not because of water or 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 um, uh, these other ideas about what you need to do to do with less but more as a as a structure and understanding how that responds and so one of the things that I, I talk often about, and, and I'm going to put Dr. Hibbert on the spot here, is, is um, uh, you know, the university still had the 1.2 pounds of nitrogen for every bushel of corn produced. We're at 0.6 today. Last year we were at 0.8 because of all the rain. Just because, I mean, we had that because it had driven some of that through the root zone. And I'm not proud of that, but Mother Nature provided that venue. And so all at once we have, we have to ask ourselves, okay, where is that nitrogen? So we do deep nitrate soil tests every year. Not a lot of them, but enough that we understand just how it's moving through our soil types and, and what ir irrigation and precipitation does to that. So that ROI has changed how we look at and understand. Is that a fun thing to go talk about at the, at the um, uh, coffee shop? No. Does my banker like to hear it? When you walk in there and, and you've got you know a ten million dollar operation and he looks at you go what two hundred and seven no way and it takes two or three years of providing him a narrative about you know how you're going to do it and these projections and pro formas and but we have the data I showed you a terabyte of data a month if I don't use that if I don't put that in front and ask you to engage in that data piece and how you define it how you can look at it and turn that into an actionable behavior changing item that answers your question that is where we will be is it 180 is it 250 that's regional that is what's the soil capacity I mean what are the, we understand it enough to know that that we're making a, a bit of a, a, a swag at it uh, but um, every year it gets better so now we're watching trends the trend is our friend we're marketing back against that. We don't hesitate to market on that ROI. If we have a profit margin that drives that, we sell. We're 97% sold. And I challenge you to talk to most producers today, and they're all looking over their shoulder going, holy smokes, I missed 450. Today the bid in our, in our ethanol production area is $3.73. Do the math. 80 cents a bushel, 200 bushel, $160 an acre. 1,000 acres, it's a lot of money. 2,000 acres, it's even more. And 5,000 acres, you're broke. So it, it, is, it is real doable. I wouldn't say that, that, I mean, that's not a recent discovery, but it, it takes the engagement of not only research, but also that educational piece and the willingness as a peer to be able to share that but also give the producer where credit is due is meeting them where they are through their eyes is they have data. They're making changes like they've never made before because of what they're seeing and it's visual. Now, is it in, in an adoption rate that's accessible, Dr. Franz? I would say no. But I think we're gonna move the needle more in the next two or three years, that same piece that I showed you with the 10, the two and the 18 months. 
I think we are going to move the needle faster. But I think also as, as peers and, and, and professionals and uh, an educational system, I think, I think that that challenge is in front of us is how do we meet that? How do we meet them where they are? Because traditionally, if we take the three or four years that it says that I have the right answer, they, they're, they're moving on. And that, that, is not, that is not a discredit to this institution or any others, Oklahoma or anywhere else. It simply is a fact of what's occurring. Now, it's frustrating that that, that 50 or 60 percent that are doing that are not adopting, but more piggybacking on to what's happening. But I, I'm okay with that if it moves the needle. Anybody else? Okay. Probably afraid. Hey, to do one last question here. Hey, Roy. Uh, by the way, Chuck Hibbard. Uh, and I always appreciate it when you give us feedback, so thank you for that. Um, and congratulations on your award. Very cool. Thank you. So Rorick and I have known each other since 1994 when he was on the Bean Commission. Um, so my dad started farming in 1953 northeast of Cozad, and he was part of a group that they competed with each other all the time. And because they competed with each other, they were selfish about what they learned. And they were selfish about how they were able to grow better corn or alfalfa or whatever. And I observed back in the day, and I still think today, I don't think that made them better. And so here you come, and you are incredibly generous. You're generous with your time, your ideas, the investments that you make your leadership, et cetera. And I'm just curious, what's different about you or what? when was the, the switch flipped for you to decide that being generous with your ideas, your time, your leadership was the right thing for you in the role that you play in production agriculture? I, I, I just got to go back to that. Um when the Twin Plat NRD was challenged with the uh, designation of fully and over appropriated and, and that it could impact my investment in irrigated ground um, is, I didn't understand that. I had no clue. But I also acknowledge that that competitive piece is, is still alive and well today in, in agriculture. And, 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 and probably the most importantly that it's competitive about or, or very secretive about is is because of land is is if you own it the competition factor really does kind of die away a little bit but if you're competing for you know landlords you're competing for um uh, maintaining your own operation because you have this bricks and mortar or this m e machinery and equipment investment that that is you if you lose that part of your operation then you become not sustainable you can't you cannot uh uh, handle it uh, economically. I tried that downsizing piece, by the way, and it was it, it was met with a, a bit of resistance on the cash flow side. But what's different is um, everything that they did. Everything th there wasn't a lot of regulatory expectations. Um, most of those guys were hardworking. You know, you know, the sweat off my brow, and and um, they're very diversified. Um, they they had chickens and cows and, and everything that we grew up with, uh, Chuck. And I know you, you kind of the same realm of, of what I did is is when I tell my kids that I gathered eggs and took them in every Sunday and traded them for groceries so that we could go have a a, um, a malt at the Rexall store. That was our trip to town once a week. And now, my gosh, if you can get them to stay home once a week, you're 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 doing pretty well. What's different? is um, that slide you saw the consumer and then when I hesitated to put that arrow back uh, up to the grower and that connection between the consumer and the grower and the, the accountability that's going to come with that is uh, there, there's, there's no secrets that, that uh, social media is changing that perspective, good and bad. Um, I'm on Twitter and I talk about conservation. I talk about activities. I'm, I, I'm not political on it at all, nor will I be. 
and that has changed the, the field. I actually belong to a peer group that has nothing to do with the state of Nebraska. We have a farm from, from central Illinois, New York, um, oh my gosh, North Carolina, central Alabama, and the Panhandle of Texas. We meet a couple times a year, and I just, that's, where I, that's where I was at, is in Fresno, and so that we could talk about those ideas and not be worried about competition, that they're gonna swoop in and, and um, um, uh, help us, but talking about HR and marketing and global issues and challenges that you see because collectively that, that social media that connected us that we all have come to, to hold in our hand and hold dearly, it is invaluable. But is it really gonna make a difference in that, in that attitude? I'd go back to what Trenton asked earlier, is that that still is a stigma, is that competitiveness about technology. I will tell you that my neighbors watch what we do. They start and stop their pivots when we do it. They do it. They even bought the, the remote control unit so they don't even have to drive out there. They can, oh, Roy's water, and boom, start their pivot. And, and I'm okay with that, because you know what? I've invested in, in, in that resource piece um, and, and that's st I still don't understand their, their financial complexity enough to know whether it's doing them any good or not and that is irrelevant to me. It is more about what are we going to do collectively with the resources that, that are put in our hands and our stewardship and our responsibility, our legacy. I have a son that, like I said, is in his sixth crop. I have a, I have a grandson that's five that he's in his fifth crop. If you ask him, he already knows more than grandpa does. And and, and, and that's, that's who he is, and that's okay. And they're going to grow up in a different competition. But what's going to bite them? And what, yeah, here's what I get in the coffee shop. So I come in and I'm dressed like this, and they go, oh, Rourke's off the Lincoln again. I go, you're right. Attaboy, work. Go ahead. So what's going on now? Well, I'm going on a, I'm going on a water quality committee. Well, why would you do that? I said, because nitrates in drinking water. Nitrates in drinking? No way. I said, yes way. And guess what? Who they think is the problem? Oh, feedlots. Cities. No. No. Not at all. Us. Agriculture. Animal. Row crop. Agriculture. Well, you just go on down there. Had a boy. And I'll leave you with this. Again, you know, if you do nothing long enough, Chuck... I think you get exactly what you deserve. And I, I have great friends that will figure it out, I think. And there are others that are going to be a result of that, of that reluctance. I don't even want to call it ignorance because it's still about an ROI model. It's still about I have to make money one way or the other. And I think we have to provide that venue or that opportunity, that engagement, and have we done it well for the last 20 years? I think if we, I, I can say that, I can say that most people say they have, but I'm going to go back to have we met them where they are and have we seen it through their eyes? I think that's where we are today. I think that is going to change that conversation. I really do. Who's that going to be up to? I think all of us. Well, we had some through his eyes and, and an awful lot through his mouth and <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of good comments. So let's give Rorick a big round of applause, please.